Good evening, I'm Robin Osborne and I am the current chair of the Faculty of Classics. And it's my great pleasure this evening to do something that many of my predecessors have hoped that would happen in their time as chair, and that is to launch the Cambridge Greek Lexicon. The Cambridge Greek Lexicon has been for the Faculty of Classics at, at Cambridge, its British Library project, a project that has gone on for a lot longer than the faculty hoped it would, and inevitably has cost a lot more than the faculty would hope it would. It hasn't quite cost the 511 million pounds that is sometimes quoted uh, as the cost of the British Library, uh, but it has taken longer than the British Library project, not a mere 16 years, but some 23 years to bring to fruition. It would have been impossible to bring this project to fruition without the generosity of a very large number of individuals and institutions. I'm not going to name them all now, uh, which would take far too long, but I'm very pleased to welcome representatives from many of those institutions and to welcome many of those generous individuals to this launch. We had, of course, hoped that this launch would be a launch in person that we could have a massive party to celebrate this landmark event. Um, we're very sad that we end up doing this online, but we are very happy that that enables us to embrace such a large number of you uh, to come and join with us uh, on this occasion. We are not going to take questions and answers at this um, session. Oh, not going to take questions and give them answers uh, live, I should say, at this session. Um, but we have enabled a question and answer function so that if you have questions that you wish to ask at any point in the proceedings or any comments that you would like to make, uh, feel free to use that function. We will uh, respond to those questions uh, by email uh, after uh, the session is over. There is one person who has held this whole project together, for whom the project has come to dominate his life for very much longer uh, than he uh, could ever have imagined when he first agreed to be involved. That person is Professor James Diggle. James is, as many of you will know, Emeritus Professor of Greek and Latin here, an extraordinarily distinguished Hellenist, and he has acted as Editor-in-Chief, and it is right and proper that this evening we give him the first word to tell us about the Cambridge Greek Lexicon. James. The story of the lexicon begins with John Chadwick. He's best known for his collaboration with Michael Ventris on the decipherment of Linear B. But before that, as a young man, he'd served for six years on the editorial staff of the Oxford Latin Dictionary. And towards the end of his life, he returned to lexicography. In his final work, Lexicographica Graeca, he demonstrated some of the inadequacies in the content and method of Liddell and Scott's Greek lexicon by examining around 80 words and showing how the job could have been done so much better. In 1997, he persuaded the Faculty Board of Classics to oversee a project to revise the abridged version of Liddell and Scott, sometimes known as the intermediate lexicon. The original lexicon of Liddell and Scott was published in 1843 and it has been continuously revised. The last edition, the ninth, was published between 1925 and 1940, revised and augmented throughout, as the title page has it, 
by Henry Stuart Jones, hence the acronym by which it is generally known, LSJ. The Intermediate Lexicon was published in 1889 and was based on the seventh edition of Little and Scott, published in 1882. This Intermediate Lexicon has been continuously in print for over 130 years and has never been revised. And yet it remains the lexicon most commonly used by students in English schools and universities. There's also still in print a smaller abridged edition based on an even earlier edition of Little and Scott. So here they are, shoulder to shoulder, the family of three, Little Little, Middle Little, and Father Little, sometimes known as Great Scott. The Greek Lexicon Project was formally established in 1998. Anne Thompson was appointed as editor. Pat Easterling was appointed to chair a management committee. And I was appointed to chair an advisory committee. The project was designed to be completed within five years. So why has it taken us over 20 years? Necessitated the appointment of a gradually increasing number of editors and the raising of huge financial support. Before I answer that question, let's consider how you might go about producing a new dictionary. There are two ways. The most economical way, plan A, is to base yourself on what has gone before and then correct and supplement it. That was the method of Little and Scott and then of LSJ. The first edition of 1843 was based on a dictionary published in Germany 12 years before. There are serious weaknesses in this kind of dictionary making, which persist in LSJ. If you base yourself on your predecessors, the structure of an article may remain unchanged, old material may be taken on trust and not re-examined, supplementary material is apt to be added piecemeal. Translations sometimes live on in English that has become antiquated. The other way, plan B, is to start again from scratch. First, gather your own material by reading the text afresh. Enter the material on slips of paper and then put the slips in order. This was the method of Dr. Johnson, whose Dictionary of the English Language was the product of his own unaided reading, though he needed six helpers to copy the quotations which he had marked in his books, and it took him eight years. This was the method of the Oxford Latin Dictionary, which employed in all 17 editors over a period of 35 years. Above all, this was the method of the Oxford English Dictionary, which employed an army of volunteer readers and took 70 years. Here is the editor, James Murray, with some of his assistants in his scriptorium in Oxford. So to return to my question, why have we taken over 20 years? Because as soon as work began, it became clear that the plan as originally conceived was unworkable. The intermediate lexicon of 1889 was even less satisfactory than we and John Chadwick had imagined. It could not be revised. Plan A, it would have to be completely rewritten 
plan B. So the faculty board agreed that we should compile a new and independent lexicon. This would still be of intermediate size and designed primarily to meet the needs of modern students, but it would also be designed to be of interest to scholars insofar as it would be based upon a fresh reading of the Greek texts and on principles differing from those of LSJ. The lexicon has grown to over 1,500 pages. The intermediate lexicon has 900 pages, so we are larger by about 70%. At the outset, we were fortunate in engaging the support of the Pursuit Project based in the USA. Using the resources of the Pursuit Digital Library, an American colleague helped us to create an electronic database containing most of the texts to be covered, with each word in its context and matched with an accompanying translation. In time, this resource was superseded by the Thesaurus Linguae Graecae. For the first time in the history of lexicography, it was possible to find every word at the press of a computer key and to examine that word in its context. For composing entries, we developed a tagging or coding system in XML. This is a very complex system using over a hundred different tags. It's the brainchild of one of our own number, Bruce Fraser. So what is distinctive about our lexicon? I've tabulated its distinctive features under eight headings. I'll first explain these headings and then illustrate them from entries in the lexicon. First, author coverage. The coverage of the lexicon extends from Homer to the early second century AD, ending with Plutarch's Lives. We include all of the major authors who fall within that period, and most of the minor ones, and many new texts are known to LSJ, such as Sappho and Menander, texts which have turned up on papyri in recent years. We also include some New Testament Greek in the form of Gospels and Acts. In all, we feature about 37,000 Greek words used by about 90 different authors. Organization of entries. We don't organize entries according to chronological or grammatical criteria, as LSJ normally does. In other words, we don't automatically start with Homer or with the active voice before getting to the middle or passive, or put constructions with the accusative before constructions with the genitive or dative. Instead, we organize entries according to meaning. We aim to show the developing senses of words and the relationships between those senses. So we begin with the root sense of a word, which may well appear not in the earliest author who uses that word, but in a later author. And then, in numbered sections, we trace its different applications in the different contexts in which it appears. We shall see examples of this in a moment. Introductory summaries. For some longer entries, especially verbs, we give an introductory summary to show the reasoning behind the grouping or sequence of the numbered sections. Again, we shall see this shortly. Definitional phrases. Where necessary, we give explanatory definitional phrases in addition to translations. What you may ask is the difference between a definition and a translation. A definition describes the general sense of a word 
and it may be applicable to that word in a variety of contexts. A translation reflects the meaning of the word in a specific context. On the page, we make a visual distinction between these two. By giving the definition in a Roman font, the translation in bold. Again, we shall see this soon. Author labels. We don't give precise references to specific passages such as Euripides Medea 243, but use author abbreviations alone. You see them in the left hand column of the author list. And we use some collective labels for groups of authors. For example, tragedy, abbreviated to trag, refers to all three of A-S-E, that is Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides. And for the most part, we don't give Greek quotations. Now, the omission of specific references and the omission of Greek quotations may seem surprising, and it is perhaps our most striking change from LSJ. So let me explain our reasons. If you cite a single specific passage to illustrate a word or usage, you run the risk by being so selective of giving a partial or distorted picture. By omitting specific references and quotations, we gain a great deal of additional space for material of a more helpful kind. We can refer to a much wider range of passages and we can give more detail about the contexts. That is what is referred to by the heading added contextual material. The penultimate heading is cross-references. We give copious cross-references. Here is part of a page consisting of little else. I've highlighted the two examples of the form AirSAM. A student who encounters this form needs to be guided to both of the verbs to which it belongs. And we use contemporary English. We don't translate crocotos like LSJ as a saffron colored robe worn by gay women. And as for the words which brought a blush to Victorian cheeks, we spare no blushes. We don't explain be nepo, like the intermediate lexicon as coera of illicit intercourse, but simply translate it by the F word. Nor do we translate the verb lycasdo as to wench but define it as perform fellatio and translate it by an expression so crude that I'd better leave it on the printed page. I'll illustrate the features I've been describing by reference to two entries. First, the adjective kalos. If someone asks you to say what it means in one English word, you'll probably say beautiful. Fair enough. But you need to consider what kinds of noun the adjective is applied to and whether it is necessary to introduce other translations which suit them better. And once you look at this word in its contexts, you'll see how many different shades of meaning it can have. We begin with a definition in a Roman font. Beautiful in appearance. This is the root sense of the adjective, the sense from which all other senses are derived. The adjective is applied in this sense 
to humans, deities, animals, their bodies. Three translation words are offered in bold font. Not just beautiful, but also handsome and good looking. This use is so common that a bare Homer plus is all we need. Then in section two, we bring in a different type of noun, places and features of the natural world. The original definition is still applicable, but not all of the original translations will suit, so we bring in a different one, fair. Then in section three, we move from natural things to created things. In section four, we move away from beauty of appearance to beauty of sound. Then we move away from beauty altogether to a more general sense, for which the rather elaborate definition reads, as a term of general commendation of things or circumstances, good in terms of quality, practical usefulness, or capacity to satisfy or give pleasure. And we offer three translations, good, excellent, fine. And here for the first time, we introduce a new author label as an ironical use appears from the tragic poets onward. Then in section six, some applications of this sense in specific circumstances. Then in seven to eight, some uses of the neuter in verbal or prepositional phrases. And you'll notice that our translations are now in italic. This is because we're translating a phrase, not a single word. Then in nine, we move to something decidedly new when the adjective acquires a moral connotation in application to things said or done. And in ten, we have a specific development of this use when it is spared with agathos, good, but not before Herodotus to describe a particular type of man, occasionally a woman, who combines various types of excellence, fine and good, upstanding, decent. And this pairing becomes so much a part of ordinary usage that it can even be applied to places or manufactured items, an island, an oil flask, My second example is the verb echo, whose basic senses are have and hold. Our entry for this verb runs to 55 sections. I'm not going to try your patience by taking you through them. I simply want to make one general point. If a verb has as many applications as this, you need to provide the reader with signposts to show how you've organized the material, to show that you've organized the numbered sections in groups, and that these groups follow logically one from the other. So here is our initial summary of the groups. We move from the physical, sections one to three, hold by physical contact, to the less physical, section four, hold in one's possession, then to the non-physical, beginning in section 15, as for example in have thoughts or have consequences. And this development is marked by a shift of sense from hold to have. There's also a distinct group from section 29 onwards in which the sense is hold back, constrain or restrain. And finally there's a group of intransitive uses and a group of uses in the middle voice. This introductory summary makes it easier for the reader to navigate through what is a very long and complex article. Here is one page of our article, 
with the corresponding page of LSJ on the right. Two columns of densely packed material with little to guide you. The labyrinth of Minos was more easily penetrable than many an article of LSJ. Samuel Johnson described the lexicographer as a harmless drudge. Hausman mocked the compilers of the Thesaurus Linguae Latinae as the chain gangs working at the dictionary in the Ergastulum at Munich. I and my colleagues have drudged in the Ergastulum in Sidgwick, but I hope and believe that we have created something which will be of lasting service to students and scholars, and in which the faculty and all those many others who have helped, supported, and encouraged us through these long years may take some pride. Thank you very much, James. Uh, the faculty takes enormous pride uh, in this dictionary and it takes enormous pride in the way in which Cambridge University Press um, have aided us and have produced it. It is a beautiful piece of bookmaking, uh, quite apart from anything else. But what we want to do in the next half hour is to celebrate the words in the dictionary, the words in the dictionary and the words beyond the dictionary. And I've asked five of my colleagues representing the full range of classical studies, philology, philosophy, history, art and archaeology, as well as uh, Greek literature, to take a word and take you through that word. And Pippa Steele is going to be the first. She is the principal investigator on a European Research uh, Council funded project um, that goes by the name of Cruz as in the cruise of ships, um, as opposed to cruising in ships, uh, which is the context and relations of early writing systems. And her own interest is in the earliest writing of Greek, and indeed uh, writing of other languages than Greek. Uh, and uh, Pippa is going to introduce us to a very early word. Pippa. Thank, thank you. you. I chose the word basil use, best known as the Greek word for a king, because of its quite remarkable semantic journey over the last 3,500 years or so. As is often the case with the story of semantic change, this is also a story of social and cultural changes. The word is first attested in the Mycenaean records written in Linear B, the earliest surviving records in the Greek language. But basil use is not a word of Greek etymology and was probably borrowed from a contemporary non-Indo-European language. In the syllabic Linear B writing system, it was spelt out like this, quasi reu, representing guazil use, which begins with a labiovelar consonant gw that later developed into a b by a regular sound change. But what is really striking is that the Mycenaean guazil use is anything but a king. The term is usually used in a context of workshops where it refers to a person apparently overseeing the work of others, in this case, in a bronze workshop. In Mycenaean society, the position at the top of the social hierarchy is held instead by a person with the title Wanax, which is the later Anax. What we don't know is how the word guazil use 
goes from a term for a workshop overseer to a term for a king and a leader of men, as we find it in the Homeric epics. The Mycenaean Grazzle use is apparently in a position of control over groups of workers and perhaps has some localised power. But where is the trigger for semantic change? A romantic interpretation might be that when the Mycenaean palace culture is destroyed, apparently violently, at the end of the 13th century BC, there are people who were once quite low down the social hierarchy who now take advantage of a power vacuum to assume control over groups of other people. And so the Grazzle use goes from an overseer to a king. But sadly, while the archaeological record can help us to understand ensuing social changes, the practice of writing seems to disappear for a few hundred years at this point, meaning that we have no way of knowing how the term guazal use or basil use was used in the intervening period. In the mythic past that is the subject of the recorded versions of the Homeric poems, there were many local Basileis who were kings of groups of people who went to fight in the Trojan War. The usage of the word Basil use was to change further over time, especially as monarchies began to disappear from the Greek speaking world. Even in the classical period, some Greek speaking areas did continue to have kings, as for example in Cyprus, as here in this coin of King Evagoras I of Salamis. But in a place like democratic Athens, by then devoid of kings, there was far less use for the term basil use. But that did not mean that the word disappeared from usage altogether and far from it. Greek conflict with the Persians, along with the mistrust of the concept of monarchy, saw the term basil use being applied in Greek writing to the Persian high king, sometimes as a megas basil use or simply the basil use. From here, the word passed into later Greek in the context of new political structures that followed the classical period. Alexander the Great, as he amassed his empire, labelled himself a basil use, as did his Ptolemaic successors. The term was also applied to Roman emperors, if often unofficially in Greek writing. And later, basil use was a title of the Byzantine emperors and later still of the kings of Greece in more modern times. Surviving derivatives that remain in common use today tend to preserve the general meaning of basil use as a king. From the legendary monster, the basilisk, the serpent king, to the culinary basil, the king of herbs, or perhaps better, the herb of kings, but not, we may note, the herb of a workshop overseer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fifa. There is no group within the Faculty of Classics that spends more time, I think, worrying about the precise meaning of terms uh, than the philosophers notorious for their endless uh, sessions reading and poring over texts. And um, Gabor Bertek is the current Lawrence Professor of Ancient Philosophy, uh, and he is going to introduce us to a term that we might have expected rather to be talked about by a historian. Gabor. Thank you. Um, yeah. So I've chosen the word Syngenes to illustrate ways in which uh, philosophers can give new layers of signification to words. As you can see from the lexicon entry, the adjective Syngenes, as it occurs in the text of poets, tragic writers, historians and orators from Hinder, Pindar to Aeschylus and Sophocles, Herodotus and Thucydides, primarily uh, refer to things and people who are related by birth, uh, who have the same ancestry and belong in the same family, or genos. We normally suppose that people know who they are singing as with, who their relatives are. Yet in many of these stories, the center of the intrigue and the source of doom and destruction is precisely that the characters do not recognize or recognize too late that they are in fact singing 
Or when they know who they, their relatives are, they don't honor what they owe to those with whom they are singers. Now, as soon as philosophers extended the meaning of the word genos from relations based on birth, to classify things and to reveal also other types of structural relations in the world. The word syngenes could immediately be used to express that two or more entities belong in the same kind, genus, with no reference to being linked by birth. At once, to uncover which things are syngenes and which things are not and why has become a central task of the philosopher insofar as she wants to understand the structure of reality. And this effort might lead to unexpected recognitions. For instance, through a classification of crafts on the basis of the type of action and function they perform, the activity of the haughty sophist can turn out to be syngenes with that of the undistinguished angler, or the mighty king from royal ancestry can emerge as syngenes with the shepherd of the humblest origins. Now, philosophers devise formal methods such as dialectics uh, to, help the to, to help the recognition of Singanaya relations among things in the world. However, the outcome of these philosophical efforts is often not merely a descriptive classificatory scheme. For instance, the Socrates of Plato's Phaedo recognizes, with the help of philosophical arguments, that his soul, and indeed all human souls, are syngenes with the divine, changeless, intelligible, and always self-same forms. This recognition comes with normative force and opens up possibilities. We ought to get to know the forms, these divine relatives of us, and we ought to spend as much time with them as possible to cultivate this relation. In one sense, syngeneia is a relation that is there to be recognized and acknowledged, in another sense, however, Singanea is an opportunity that has to be worked on and be uh, realized by a conscious lifelong effort. The realization and cultivation of Singanea relations is central not only to the philosophical life, but is the foundation of the house society as well. As Plato expresses in The Statesman, people tend to recognize as their syngenes only those who exhibit and value the same character traits as themselves. They tend to praise and to stick to those who are like them and to disparage and to distance themselves from those who are different. According to Plato, this self-intensifying, polarizing dynamics leads to an ever-growing rift and animosity in society. We might, of course, think of current day echo chambers and their deleterious effects on our society. The greatest challenge and task for a political community is that its members ought to recognize that Sunganaya goes beyond such perceived similarities and commonalities, and in fact extends to all its members. Correspondingly, the principal task of the political leader is to facilitate um, uh, the recognition of this broader underlying Sunganaya. Failure to recognize this natural syngenea that connects us all can lead to tragic consequences for the entire community. But how can we go beyond surface resemblances and recognize those with whom we are genuinely syngenes? In fact, Plato offers the answer to that question in the opening scene of the same dialogue. Both of Socrates' two young interlocutors exhibit some surface resemblance to the, him. One of them is like Socrates in his physical facial features, whereas the other happens to bear the same name as Socrates. But such external features amount to nothing. And here is uh, Socrates' suggestion, I quote, Well, we must always be eager to recognize those syngenized with us through discussion, dialogo. I would like to suggest that this is one important philosophical contribution to this word. Journey in Singanaya might go beyond relations of birth and surface resemblances, yet it is our task to discover and to acknowledge it dialogue through rational discussion and then to maintain and to foster it by keeping up the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gavel. History is capable of getting its own back, however, on philosophy. And Hannah Woolley, my colleague, lecturer in Greek history, uh, has chosen to talk to you about what you might have expected to be a philosophical word, theoria. Hannah. Thank you. Okay. 
So in discussing the aims of the new lexicon, the editors expressed their desire to provide a more coherent picture of the senses of words, the links between them and how they develop. Diarrhea, my chosen word for today, provides, I think, a good example for how important that can be for helping students and scholars when they approach a text. Theoria derives via theoros, as seen on the right hand of your screen, from two sight words, thea and horao, and so can be translated at base as the act of viewing a sight or the sight which is viewed. Oh. Sorry, PowerPoint, there we go. Um, we thus find the senses sightseeing or viewing, as well as sight, view or spectacle. The appeal in this word for me is that it also has some fairly technical uses. So you'll see under four and five, attendance at a festival and specifically a state delegation to a festival or an oracle. And under eight, the concept of contemplation, which takes on a technical sense in philosophical works of the fourth century. When looking at the technical uses of a word like theoria, it's often productive to ask to what extent and in what ways these quote unquote sophisticated uses are colored by and informed by the broader semantic field and by one another. There's been lots of work done on this question in relation to theoria. And so I thought today I'd show you a couple of passages that are engaged in this sort of play. I start with a Stanford classicist and philosopher, Andrea Nightingale, who has explored at length the ways that fourth, fourth century philosophers seeking to conceptualize and legitimize their intellectual practice drew on the rhetoric and structures of festival theoria. As the word comes to acquire a technical philosophical sense, as these authors grapple with what it is that their project consists in, they do so by borrowing from existing models of theoria to religious festivals. In Plato's Republic, for example, a text replete with the language of theoria and of spectacles, Nightingale explores how the philosopher's famous trip out of the cave to experience the ideal forms before returning to the human community to report on what he has experienced, draws on the religious, political, and social significance of the civic institution of theoria. Theoria then for Nightingale imports religious awe alongside civic duty and the act of viewing something worth seeing and brings all these to the developing philosophical concept. So let's take a text to explore these ideas. Aristotle's Protrapticus, a text surviving only in fragments, was intended to persu persuade the reader to pursue philosophy. In the passage here, Aristotle reimagines the traditional image of the islands of the blessed, the paradisical haven of those who have escaped the human condition, whether through divine favor, superhuman achievements, or initiation. In his version, what one does in this realm is simply to contemplate, that is, to engage in theoria. This philosophical practice of theoria is contrasted explicitly and favorably with the practice of theoria as ordinarily understood as physical journeys to festivals to see the sights. In stating that any one of us might reside in the Isles of the Blessed through the practice of philosophy, Aristotle thus deliteralizes the journey and deliteralizes the sensory observations usually associated with theoria. We might go further. By swapping the festival of Dionysus or the Olympic games for the Isles of the Blessed, Aristotle might be thought to retain or indeed to intensify the ritualized significance the word could be held to evoke. Aristotle here, though recognizing the value of the sites at festivals as worth more than money, is quick to contrast their banal attractions with the nature and truth of being which philosophers contemplate. Moving beyond philosophy, we find a similarly lowbrow conception of festival theoria in Aristophanes' play, Peace. Here, a personified theoria or showtime recovered along with the goddess Peace from her imprisonment by the god War, embodies all the fun of the fair, sex, drink, good food, and a feast for the eyes. Again, Aristophanes repeatedly brings to the fore in his treatment of theoria, the technical sense of attending festivals and of civic delegations. At the same time, theoria is herself the spectacle, the object to be viewed, 
as she finds herself stripped naked and surrounded by verbs of sight. Aristophanes thus conflates two senses of the word theoria in the person of theoria. At the same time, by personifying theoria and so presenting her to us as a divine or semi-divine figure, Aristophanes removes the conceptual boundary between the divine object of worship and the social occasion which surrounds that worship. Theoria becomes our sole point of focus. She is at once the party and the god in whose honour the party is thrown. So with this word, as with many others, we can see how the various uses and senses interrelate and inform one another. I want to end by joining my colleagues in offering congratulations and thanks to the team, to James and to all the generous donors for providing such a wonderful resource in helping students and scholars as they navigate these sorts of questions and texts. Thank you. In approaching my colleagues to talk this evening, I could hardly have not given a word to the Regis Professor of Greek, Professor Richard Hunter. And Richard has risen to the challenge by taking the word. Richard. Sorry, my screen share is not working. Richard, could you try again? Yeah. Can ever, is that okay? The, yes, standard, the standard scholarly lexicon of early Greek hexameter poetry is the lexicon des three Greekish and epos but familiarity lulls the critical sense. When does epos, as a Greek, not a German epos, word, first appear with the meaning epic poetry? The sense for the singular is all but completely ignored for LSJ. It is, however, well established in ancient criticism, as we know above all from the texts of the Epicurean philosopher Philodemus, recovered on papyri from Herculaneum carbonized by the explosion of Vesuvius in 79 AD. If we needed reminding, these painfully difficult texts mock our knowledge of words as indeed always provisional, always achingly poised between the fear of being shown defective and the paraded hope for new evidence, which will, as we know only too well, but keep suppressed in our hearts, prove it so. This is the true erotics of lexicography. If epos as epic poetry brings only disappointment and rejection, the search for epos as epic poem wanders as forlorn as Demeter in search of her daughter, completely absent from all the standard lexica of ancient Greek, though some have wanted to see that meaning even in famous epia of the Hellenistic poet Callimachus. Often the Telkines grumble at my song, ignorant, no friends of the muse, because I did not accomplish one continuous song about kings in many thousands of verses or heroes. But I roll out my epos over a short space like a child, while the decades of my years are not few. Lexicographers too, for however many decades they may have endured the struggle, and whose scars the harsh light of Zoom lays bare, are fated to roll out their books of Epia like innocent children, exposed to the whim of volcanic surprises which they cannot control, and to censorious reviewers, no friends of the muse, wasted by envy, ever ready to grumble. Epos in the sense a line of verse is attested early, but how early? Pindar and Herodotus first, according to the Cambridge lexicon, but what of Homer? LSJ cite two passages of the Odyssey in which they claim the plural refers to a song accompanied by music. The first passage here, Odysseus weeping at the court of King Alcinous, the second Eumaeus telling Penelope about his encounter with the beggar who is of course the disguised Odysseus. For the Cambridge lexicon, these cases presumably fall under the very cunning entry, 
quote, utterance, speech, or word, often in a sense determined by context, e.g. reference to an oracle, proverb, order, message, speech, unquote. But how would any listener to or reader of Homer understand these passages? How should a lexicon deal with meaning in the Homeric poems? What is it that we are trying to establish in the Homeric case? Meaning for whom and, or, and meaning for when? Words, epia, change. Letters remain, but the senses shift, often imperceptibly. Like us, both words and meanings grow old and are superseded by the next generation or simply not replaced. Horace knew this. As forests change their leaves as the years decline and the first fall away, so the old race of words passes and like young men, those recently born thrive and flourish. We and what is ours are owed to death. Many words which have fallen away will be reborn and words now held in honor will fall if this is willed by usage in whose power lies the decision, the right and standard of speech. In what meter could be described the exploits of kings and leaders in grim wars was shown by Homer. What matters is usus, how words are used, the greatest challenge of lexicography. Horace's illustration draws on a very famous Homeric simile, but he charts the ebb and flow of words precisely through the sense of Greek epos, werbo, vocabulum. We move across the passage from epos as word to epos as epic poetry, res gestae regumque duconque tristia bella, identified with Homer in the following verse. The passage enacts its subject as it uses the meaning and history of epos in a recognition and celebration of universal change. Words can fall thick as snowflakes, like Odysseus's, but they also melt away, like Penelope. The attempt to capture and to freeze at one instant that, that fluid process of change is one of the many things that poets and lexicographers have in common. Thanks to them, we are lost, but for words. Thank you very much, Richard. The challenge of following that extremely artful presentation of words falls to Carrie Vout, Professor of Classics, who will treat us to the art of a rather different word. Thank you very much, Robin. So the word I've chosen is pothos, longing, yearning, desire. Pothos is the word used of the swineherd's longing for Odysseus and for the grief felt by Odysseus's mother when he was at war. It was also used for a desire for one's homeland and for one's wife, all green, green grass and a warm embrace, though critically not yet perhaps never, always at arm's length. As Pothos looks beyond the present, it's also often used of the dead. Aeschylus's chorus in Persians cries, beds are filled with tears in Pothos for husbands. Each of the Persian women is left alone under the yoke of marriage, longing Pothos for the beloved husband, the bedmate she sent away, a spearman eager in battle, as the nouns love, loss, and longing are beautifully bound together. In some senses, pothos functions like desiderium in Latin, and here I mention desiderium's use only in Petronius's Widow of Ephesus episode, which again unites sexual yearning with yearning for the dead. Except that desiderium can also be an object of desire, a favorite, or a darling. Pothos is just as ardent, but it's neither concrete nor consummated, more erotic than earthy, more stimulus than realization. It's what, according to Arian and his sources, made this man get out of bed on a morning, 
Porthos to cross the Danube, Porthos to untie the legendary Gordian knot, to found Alexandria, to consult the Oracle of Amun, and so on and so on. And it's bigger than Desiderium, which is why in Latin, Alexander's Pothos translates as Ingens Cupido. In this way, Alexander is made a man driven by things unattempted and to mere mortals unattainable, determined to surpass the deeds of heroes like Achilles and Ajax, who in the song for Hermias visit Hades in Pothos for Aristotle's father-in-law and patron. In focusing on the future, Alexander's ruthlessness and drinking remain uninterrogated. There's a real romance to the term pothos, yet not so much that it's only used in poetry. Although the lexicon's entries on pothos and himeros are more or less interchangeable, in contrast, the verb himero is never found in Attic prose. Pothos is enigmatic, but what it is unnecessarily eludes us if we focus only on text. Ask what pothos means, and in some senses Alexander's famous upturned gaze is it, spirited distraction, eyes on anywhere but here. But pothos has a long history in Greek visual culture, where it was one of the few male personifications to be regularly represented together with Hemeros and Eros, who's sometimes their father, and sleep and death. In other versions of the myth, Pothos, like Hemeros and Eros, was a son of the westerly wind, an equally waxing and warming or of Aphrodite, whose chariot he and Hedy Logos, sweet talk, both pull in this late fifth century makeup box Winged wonders, identical, but in name, and this is Pothos here. Together with the figures around the belly of this Pyxis, figures of health, good order, play, happiness, humorous, harmony, and beauty, Pothos is ancillary and helps give love a language, especially important given that this pot was made during the horrors of the Peloponnesian War. By the time of Alexander's death, Eros has babyfied to become a bouncing ball of ill-disciplined energy. But Pothos remains adolescent and surprisingly languid, most famously rendered by the sculptor Scopas, leaning and lovely Aphrodite's goose by his side. Originally, perhaps, this figure type accompanied Eros and Hemeros in Aphrodite's temple at Megara, or leant against Aphrodite herself at Samothrace. But by the time we get to Rome, he's an independent entity, a pretty boy to compete with Praxiteles' satyr displayed with him. Pothos, longing, yearning, desire. His daydreaming is now an excuse to pose, sinewy, submissive, desirable, the ultimate puer delicatus, desiderium, Ingens Cupido, but in a naughtier sense. For Pothos to be a stimulus, it's got to be keenly felt. It isn't simply that longing looks like this. See this, and we experience it. Thank you very much. I am going to take the last word. My colleagues, rather curiously, though perhaps not entirely unpredictably, have honed in entirely on nouns or adjectives. And yet notoriously, it's verbs that stick most in the memory. And it's because verbs stick in the memory that we need a better dictionary than LSJ. And I want to illustrate this uh, with a confession. Uh, at least I will if I can uh, find uh, the right uh, page of my uh, laptop uh, to share. Thank you. And this concerns the verb herpo. The thing about this verb 
is it's very easy to remember what it means. Anyone who has come across it, uh, I'm sure will still remember. Go to Little and Scott and Herpo and Kath Herpo appear both meaning to creep or crawl. The entry for Herpo draws attention to the Latin serpo, serpents, slithery sliding. Very easy for us uh, to see an image of what this verb really means. Or so I once believed and acted on it. So 20 years ago, when I came to translate an inscription uh, from Delphi, but recording the return of exiles at Tegea in the Arcadian dialect, and I discovered these returning exiles uh, being described as uh, those who at the present time, Cather Ponzi, I simply translated it as those who are now creeping back. Some 15 years later, one of my former Oxford colleagues, uh, quoting this passage, produced a translation influenced by mine, only to have Robert Parker uh, tell him and me that we'd got it wrong. There's no creeping in Herpo. They are simply coming back. I desired to get that sense that Little and Scott put first as the root sense. But as James has pointed out, that's actually not quite how Little and Scott work. And in my attempt to get that root sense into the verb, I had constructed a narrative of these poor exiles not being entirely confident they can get back, and so creeping back to their city. Quite a false historical picture. One looks at this verb as it occurs in Arcadian, and there is no creeping at all. Had I gone to the Cambridge Greek lexicon, either to look up herpo or kath herpo, I would never have made this error. There we do have the root sense, which is simply to go. Herpo is the proper movement of a um, living being. And so I invite you to, to go, to go and buy our lexicon, to enjoy revisiting Greek texts and Greek words uh, that were once your friends and will come back to you in a new guise. We hope that our celebration of this lexicon this evening has renewed in you the desire to immerse yourself within the beauty and uh, the wealth of the Greek language and of Greek texts. It's been a great pleasure to be able to celebrate this with you. And we look forward to occasions when we will be able to welcome you to Cambridge to celebrate our many other exciting achievements, some of which you've seen a glimpse of from my colleagues this evening. Thank you very much. Good night.